Good morning, church. Acts chapter 16 is where uh, we're going to uh, be this morning. And um, I checked this out because I don't like to uh, sound like an expert on something I don't know anything about. So normal resting adult heart rate. I got this from the Mayo Clinic website. A normal resting adult heart rate ranges from 60 to 100 beats per minute. So I, I read that on Friday when I was writing this, and I decided I would check my own pulse, check my own heart rate. I was, it was running about 72 when I wrote this on, on Friday. 72, just sitting at my desk, just studying the Bible. Um, all over this room, uh, hearts are beating. That's a good thing. Uh, hearts are beating, moving blood around our bodies and keeping everyone in this room alive just like we like it. And um, now when we think about heartbeat, we can think of it in just those, those physical terms, uh, but heartbeat is also used to refer to uh, passion or desire or courage or love or a commitment to something or someone. If you're asked the question, what's your heartbeat, they're uh, likely not wanting to know what your beats per minute are, but they're wanting to know what drives you as a person. What's your heartbeat in life? And today's passage, the, the message coming out of it is so simple. We see the heartbeat of Paul and Silas to share the good news of Jesus Christ with anyone and everyone, even at great cost to their personal safety and security. That is their heartbeat. And the point for us is obvious. What does it look like when my heart is for those who do not yet know Jesus. What, what does that look like? Or uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna think of it this way, in fact. In the passage, uh, the man who comes to faith in Jesus, who's at the center of this story, he asks the question, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And the question I'd like us to, to ask ourselves here today, because we have a room that's largely filled with people who are already Christians, the question I want us to ask is, uh, what must we do, what must I do to see other people saved? What do I have to do to make that happen? How, how can I have a heartbeat for those who are not yet believers? And so we're picking this, uh, this up in um, chapter 16, verse 25. This is mid-story, mid-narrative. Uh, Paul and Silas are in jail because of their mission to tell uh, people about Jesus. In fact, there was, there's this powerhouse mission team, a uh, church planting team of Paul and Silas, of uh, Timothy and Luke, and uh, they were in Asia Minor. They uh, heard, saw a vision, and they crossed the Aegean Sea over into Europe for the first time, and they landed, uh, first of all, in <clears throat> the city of Philipp Philippi, uh, having received this vision to go to Europe. Their first convert was a woman named Lydia, who was a person of some means and who opened up her home uh, to the church. Other uh, converts also came to Christ, and they spent some time there and had this pattern of going to the same place where they met Lydia to also share the gospel there. There was an incident in the last message where there was this slave girl who was possessed of a spirit, the Python spirit we, we looked at, uh, something rooted deeply in Greek, in, in, in the Greek pantheon, Greek uh, religion. And uh, they cast the demon out of this girl, and it set, upset a lot of people. It was great for the girl. It wasn't great for business. And uh, the result of all of that was that Paul and Silas, uh, the two Jews among the four on the team, uh, ended up in jail. And that's where we pick up this story. They're in jail, uh, Acts 16, verse 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them, and suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, do not harm yourself for we're all here. And the jailer called out, called for lights and rushed in and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And then he brought them out and he said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. 
And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. But when it was day, the magistrates sent the police saying, let those men go. And the jailer reported these words to Paul saying, the magistrates have sent to you a scent to let you go. Therefore, come out now and go in peace. But Paul said to them, they have beaten us publicly, uncondemned, men who are Roman citizens, and have thrown us into prison. And do they now throw us out secretly? No. Let them come themselves and take us out. The police reported these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens. So they came and apologized to them, and they took them out and asked them to leave the city. So they went out of the prison and visited Lydia. And when they had seen the brothers, they encouraged them and departed. All right, here's what we're going after. When my heart is for those who don't yet know the Lord, uh, first of all, um, I have Christ at the center of my life. If you have a heart for those who don't know Jesus, That's going to flow out of the fact that you've already put Christ at the center of your life. And people who have Christ at the center of their life love to worship and pray. And that's exactly what we see Paul and Silas doing in prison. About midnight, verse 25 says, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And recall that they're doing this out of some duress. They had been beaten with rods. They had been taken to prison Uh, thrown into the innermost cell, likely in darkness, in the cold of that cell, and shackled in the midst of that cell, no way to bring any relief to themselves because they were shackled in the midst of the cell. They'd likely have not eaten anything, and in the midst of that, they're singing and they're praising God. And it's a bit shocking to us because I feel like I might not do this. I feel like the slightest little thing gets hard for me and I don't want to praise God. I feel like like under these circumstances, what we see Paul and Silas doing, if they weren't shackled, we would have seen their hands in the air worshiping as, as some of us did just a few moments ago. But often when things are hard for us, it's not our hands in the air worshiping God, it's our finger in the air wagging it at God. It's our fist in the air shaking it at God. Why would you allow this? Why is this happening to me? And the slightest little duress, and we can't handle it anymore, and some of us will come here and and not worship because life is hard, and some won't even come here. You know what? I'm not even going to go today because life is hard. And yet we have a picture here of two brothers in Christ who have Christ at the center, who in the midst of great duress are singing and praying Years before this in Jerusalem, the apostles as a group had been questioned by the religious leaders. They had been beaten by them for preaching the gospel. And Acts 5.41 says this, they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And, And I think, you know, Jesus suffered dishonor for me. Jesus suffered greatly for me. And it would be a privilege. I mean, this is the perspective we're supposed to have. It would be such a privilege for me if I got to. Not if I had to, but if I got to actually suffer for his name. And I feel challenged by that because I feel like if that's the heartbeat, do I have it to that level? Is that my passion and desire? So Paul and Silas are singing verse 25 and the prisoners, they're listening to them because they're probably a little shocked by this. Unjustly accused, unjustly imprisoned, beaten. And the prisoners are, and and yet they're still singing. And then in the midst of this this prison worship service, verse 26, suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. 
And this implies, this is not a natural act that's going on here. This is a divine act of God. This is God intervening into the situation. And, and, an, and an earthquake is playing right in to the hands of those who are worshiping, who would worship the Greek gods, because Poseidon was the god of earthquakes. They're thinking, Poseidon's mad. And this is gonna have tremendous spiritual connotations for them. Immediately, not just the earthquake, but all the doors of the prison open. Everyone's bonds are uh, unfastened. This is some earthquake. That it is even unshackling them from their bonds. Now for us, you know, reading, we're re we've been studying the book of Acts now. We're, we're 16 chapters, almost 16 chapters done here. And so we've seen this before. This isn't exactly surprising for us. There's been a couple of prison escapes already. In chapter five, the apostles escaped prison. In chapter 12, Peter escaped prison. God is working out his will. God's advancing his mission in the world and he's doing it the way he wants to do it. So in the middle of this, verse 27, you know, the earthquake has happened, uh, the doors are open, the shackles are loosed, the jailer wakes up, verse 27, he saw the prison doors were open, he drew his sword to kill himself. This is his reflex action because he thought the prisoners had escaped and he knew that in, in that culture, he knew what his job was, it was to keep those prisoners and if he didn't keep those prisoners and they escaped, he'd be responsible and he would lose his life. He would be executed immediately for allowing those prisoners to escape even if it was an earthquake. He would face recrimination for that, responsibility for that, that was the norm. Paul noticing he was gonna do this, verse 28, Paul yells to him, don't do it, don't kill yourself, don't hurt yourself, man. He says, we are all here. Now we'll talk in a minute why Paul and Silas are still there, but what about all the other prisoners? Why were they still there? At least in part it has to be because they're a bit surprised by everything that's happened here, by, by the fact that these men who are unjustly accused are singing hymns to God. Maybe they're just saying, you know what? We should leave, we should escape right now, but I wanna see the way this God show plays out. We have a front row seat to something that looks pretty crazy, and we like to see how it all plays out. So they're all there. Paul assures the jailer, we're all here. Now I have a couple of observations I wanna make about this, but the first is, this is a slap in the face to those who had accused Paul and Silas. They said back in verse 20, this is the passage we looked at last time, these men are Jews and they're disturbing our city. The businessmen who had lost their livelihood because the young girl was no longer possessed by that Python spirit, they were angry and they trumped up charges and they stirred up the magistrates to punish the two men. But in fact, far from disturbing our city, that city, they'd proven the opposite. Paul and Silas were so, were so concerned about the city that they prevented the prison escape. They're not mad. They're not accusatory at the officials, and you kind of have a sense like they could have been. They could have lashed out. They could have sought revenge. They could have found their freedom. They could have done all of that but they didn't see what had happened to them as personal. They weren't mad at the government or the government officials for setting up the circumstances for that to happen. And we so don't have this today. You know, there's so many Christians who think, oh, we're being persecuted by our government. The government's so anti-Christian. It's tax season. Those of you who gave charitable receipts are gonna get a tax break for donating to this church. You cannot, on the one hand, take that tax return that you're gonna get for donating to the gospel mission of Jesus Christ that the federal government is gonna to give to you, and on the other hand, then claim that that same government is persecuting you. If you really think you're being persecuted, don't submit your receipt. Oh, so that has a lukewarm response for sure. <laughs> This is one way we know. You know, one, I look at, the, at what so many Christians are doing today with respect to the federal government. One way we know that the church is not currently being persecuted by our government is how angry Christians are toward the government. So it's not persecution. 
It's not persecution. You know, we, we, in fact, what we need to do is the same thing Paul and Silas are doing. They're, they're keeping their mission and their politics separate, and we've confused the two. We need to look at our culture today and just accept it for what it is. It's dark. We, we, have, a, we have a leftist government that is pushing us further and further left. We see a society that's, that's, that's falling deeper still into immoral, immorality. We know that. Instead of fighting those things, why don't we just bring out the gospel? The darker it gets, the brighter the light of the gospel is. And our mission as Christians is not to reform Ottawa. Our mission as Christians is to tell people about Jesus Christ. It's to proclaim his gospel, to shed his light into a world that desperately needs to hear it. Let's stop confusing our politics with our mission. That's the first observation I have. Second, it is surprising, I said we'd come back to this, but it's surprising because Paul and Silas don't see the earthquake as God's provision to escape. They see it as an opportunity for mission. Verse 29, the jailer calls for lights and he rushes in and he's trembling with fear and he, and he falls down in front of Paul and Silas, not, not in some kind of worship, but he falls down in front of them in desperation because he sees everything happening. Then he brought out Paul and Silas, the jailer does, he brings them out of the prison and probably because after an earthquake you don't want to stay inside of a building like that. And then he says to them, here's the question that we've talked about already, sirs, uh, what must I do to be saved? If you're highlighting in your Bibles, you should highlight that line, what must I do to be saved? And it could be that the jailer at this point, he probably doesn't know much about the gospel but Paul and Silas sure have his attention. It could be that he's thinking that a sacrifice to Poseidon might be uh, necessary to appease uh, that small g God. You know, he might be in Greek God mode for how he's gonna resolve this issue. A lot of people think this way. A lot of people when they're first coming to faith in Jesus think this way. It's hard to grasp salvation as the hymn says, to grasp the fact that Jesus paid it all. Jesus paid it all. That no, no sacrifice that I could bring, no tangible sacrifice the way that the jailer might have been thinking of it with respect to Poseidon, no, no sacrifice of that nature is needed because as David said in Psalm 51 in, in his psalm of contrition over what his, his sin, the sins he had committed, David says, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. That's the sacrifice that he wants us to bring. The jailer comes in, he lays himself down in desperation before Paul and Silas. That's the thing God wants us to bring, just desperation and brokenness, and I don't know what to do. The only thing God wants is our hearts, not he doesn't want our feeble attempts to reach him on our own. The death of, of Jesus is the final sacrifice for sin, and we have to always remember that it's his work, not ours, that saves us. And you and I need only humbly present ourselves to him as a sinner in need of his grace. Now back to Paul and Silas, we're, we're seeing how their heart for those who don't yet know Jesus flows from the fact that they have Christ at the center of their lives. And this is so important for us, but again, it's a point we struggle with so much. Built into the Christian life is an understanding that it isn't about me. That's the phrase. It's not about me. It's not about me. Put that on t-shirts, it's not about me. Put that on coffee cups, it's not about me. It's not about me. In fact, let's do a little exercise here today. Why don't you just say that phrase with me? It's not about me. Say it again. One more time. It's not about me. You say it, but you have to believe it, that it's not about me, it's not about you. And sadly, some, some Christian, I'm gonna put that in quotes, some Christian teaching puts you and me at the center because we have been um, 
influenced by this me-centered culture that we live in, and it's infiltrated the church, it's, it's distorted the gospel in our midst. We, we live in this culture, and meism is the religion of the day. And there is a version of it, a cult of it, that is called Christian meism. At least that's what I'm going to call it. And in the religion of Christian meism, I am the preacher proclaiming my own worth. In Christian meism, I am the worship leader singing my own praises. In Christian meism, I am the counselor discipling myself along a me-centered path that I think is leading to life, but is in fact leading to death and destruction. If Christ is not at the center, then I'm at the center. And if I'm at the center, it's not Christ I'm worshiping, but me. And Paul and Silas have none of this. Christ is at the center. Now, one way this can play out, and, and this is just an example, because we're talking about having a heart for people who don't yet know Jesus, and we're gonna enter into conversations with people who don't yet know Jesus, and we have to know how to share the gospel with them, and we'll talk about that in a few moments. But one way that this could play out in our witness is with the idea that we all bear the image of God. In, in other words, that can be a starting point for a conversation with someone about the gospel. We all bear the image of God, which that's a truth that we understand from the scriptures. So that when you're sharing the gospel with someone who doesn't yet know Christ, this can be a good starting point for a conversation with someone who, for example, might be struggling with their gender identity or uh, with someone who is struggling with their sexuality, someone who is struggling with uh, destructive behaviors to remind them that they're in the image of God, someone who's struggling with suicidal thoughts and tendencies, someone who has low self-worth, to take them to the place where you have a conversation about them being image bearers of God. And so you say to them in the midst of this conversation, I understand that you're struggling with fill in the blank. And then you say, I, I want you to know this. The first thing I need you to know is that you've been made in the image of God. You bear his image. And you are precious to him. And he loves you. And he wants to give you purpose in life. And all of, all of that is true. All of that is amazing to be able to say that to someone and, and to point to them to that in the scriptures. But that can only be the starting point. If we take that starting point, those truths, and we, and we extend that all the way through, that focus on them, if we extend that all the way through, then we end up creating this distorted gospel. It's no longer the gospel of Jesus Christ. You have meism because you've put the person at the very center of the story, not Jesus, not what he's done, not who he is. Now, the way this plays out, because if, if this had been Paul and Silas, who had this, like, you know, we're in the image of God. We're in the image of God. God loves us. God thinks we're precious. God wants good things for us. If, if Paul and Silas are in prison thinking that, rather than exalting Jesus Christ, then when those prison doors open and those shackles fall off, what are they gonna do? They're gonna go, I'm out of here because God wants me happy and healthy and prospering and blessed. I'm precious to him. He can't possibly want me to be in prison. He loves me. He can't possibly be happy about the fact that we were beaten. But they don't do that. That's not them. They're Christ-centered. They're mission-centric. They're, they're others oriented in their life. They see the miracle not as a release for themselves, they see it as a gospel opportunity. John Paul Hill said this, though freed, Paul and Silas did not attempt to escape. The miracle served not to deliver them, but to deliver the jailer.
Do you want to flesh it out even a little bit more? Do you want to flesh it out a little bit more? You're rightfully cautious. Meism. Christian meism sees human effort contributing to salvation. Human effort contributing to our salvation. I do something. Some, I have some part in my salvation. I say a prayer, I do good works, I'm, I'm religious, I go to church, I give an offering, I serve, I'm a good person, therefore I'm a Christian. The problem with this is it, it so mitigates God's part, whatever percentage we think is our part, and we give the rest to God, it mitigates His part, and all of a sudden, I have some stake in my salvation. I have some, some play with God. After all, I brought something to the table. And that's meism. I come with nothing. Merely belief. Meism, secondly, sees the blessing of God selfishly. I, I see blessings. If I'm into meism, I see that blessings are for my personal good and they're for my benefit. God has blessed me. I love that God is blessing me. Look how much he loves me. Look how much he's blessed me. And it becomes again about me. Rather than I see the blessings that God has given to me as something that I can leverage to be more engaged in the mission. Several examples. Do I, you get some extra cash comes your way. Do you see that as now I get to do such and such, now I get to go to that place that I've always wanted to go to? Or do you see that extra cash as, I could now do more for the mission. I could leverage this bonus money, this extra that's come in, to help other people come to faith in Jesus Christ. Do you look at retirement? As I, I can't wait to retire, more me time. My time's been all about other people, but now that I'm retired, it's me time. Or do you see it as more hours available to do ministry, to be involved in the mission? Do you see your house as solely your refuge from the world? Or do you see what God has given to you as a place of ministry and mission? Do you see your abilities, your energies, your smarts as a way to advance your career and your profile? Or do you see these things as gifts from God to advance the gospel. Meism interprets conflict, interpersonal conflict. Meism, meism interprets interpersonal conflict always in my favor. Things are gonna go my way. I, I see the conflict my way. That person is always wrong. Meism retains offenses. It holds on to bitterness. It refuses to forgive because I wasn't wrong. I can fixate on how that person hurt me, how that circumstance affected me. And humility, which is a hallmark of the Christian life, the Christ-centered life, is, is crowded out by pride because it becomes all about me. And ultimately, this is self-destructive. Far from putting myself at the center and winning, I lose terribly. A meism, fourthly, gives personal sin a pass. I interpret scriptures and I look for interpretations of scripture that, um, that see things in a way that will always tip in my direction. So I find interpretations or I create interpretations that tell me it's okay to have sex outside of heterosexual marriage. It's okay to live with my a partner rather than get married. It's okay to omit that extra income from my tax return. It's okay to steal time from my employer. I find ways to interpret the scriptures that give me a pass on my personal sin. Now listen, to come back to something Jordan said in the call to worship, 
about expectations and why you're here today. If you've come here today thinking, I hope I get something out of church. I hope I get something out of church. You're not likely to get something out of church. It's the wrong attitude. It's meism in our worship. If you came today saying, I hope my worship is acceptable to God. If you came today to genuinely pray and say your amen at, at the end of the prayers. If you came today to hear the word of God, to have the Holy Spirit sear it into you. If you came today to become a better disciple of Jesus Christ, to take further steps along the path, if you came for those reasons, if you came today with a hope that you could care for someone, that you could encourage them, that you could love them, that you could serve them in some way, if you came with that, then you get the gospel. You have Christ at the center. Let's look at a second. When I have a heart for people to know Jesus, I know how to share the gospel. To the question that the jailer had asked Paul and Silas, they replied, this is verse 31, they replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Now Luke only gives us a summary of the conversation here, and no doubt there was a more complete understanding or explanation, expansion, explanation of the gospel, which we see actually in verse 32. And they spoke, having said that one statement, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. They spoke the word of the Lord to them. They, they took the time to expand on that one direct statement. And they explained it to the jailer and they explained it to all that were in his household. Now, it may be that this wasn't the first time that he was hearing the gospel. It, it, it may be that he had already heard it in town in the weeks prior to their arrest. Philippi wasn't a big place. It was a, a city at the time, a town really uh, between five and 10,000 people, so not big at all. These four out-of-towners come in, these foreigners come in, and they're proclaiming this gospel message which no one had heard before. And no doubt it would have drawn the attention of everyone in town. Everyone would have known that they were there, all 10,000 of them, if that's how many were living at the time. This was them coming to town and talking about the gospel is the equivalent of Netflix dropping a new season of The Crown. Okay, I really thought that was gonna hit better than it did. <laughs> I was convinced that that was a good illustration. Oh, well, make a note there, Jordan, for me. Everybody would have known. It's likely the jailer had already heard something of the gospel. And this is really when we talk about how do we explain the gospel, this is where it breaks down for many because even if you have a heart to tell people about Jesus, you may lack the courage to do so. And so often that's what we hear. I know how to explain it, but I just shrunk back in fear at explaining it to them. And sometimes that, that fear or that lack of courage is because we don't know what we would say. We don't actually know how to explain the gospel to someone. So we've tried to make this easy for you. Several months ago, I did a message where we talked about various ways to explain the gospel. It was just about last August. And we've talked about this for years and years. And the one key way that we have chosen to emphasize the explanation of the gospels with the five uh, gospel words. And this is on our website. And there's a link in the notes to this. But the five gospel words, if you could just remember these five words, you can explain the gospel to someone. The words are God, sin, substitution, believe, and life. And we start with the premise that there is a, a God. There is a God. The vast majority of human beings on the planet believe in some kind of divine being. They have an inner sense of this. It's what Pascal called the God-shaped vacuum. It's what Calvin called divinitus, a uh, sensus divinitus. It's what Solomon in Ecclesiastes called uh, eternity in our hearts. And most people will agree with this. 
And in fact, this would be the point too, that if you were talking to a certain person, you say there is a God. And in fact, not only is there a God, but he made you in his image. What we had talked about earlier. The starting point for this conversation has to be that there is a God for us to tell the, the larger narrative, the big story over all of this. But the problem with this is that our sin has created a chasm between us and our God who created us and in whose image uh, we uh, exist. That chasm between us and God is not something we can cross on our own. We can't bridge it. We have nothing inside of ourselves that's gonna help us get back into relationship with the God who made us and sin created that for us. The consequence of sin is death, not only physical death, but spiritual death, spiritual death being eternal separation from God. That's the bad news, but God provided a remedy for us. Even though we can't bridge the gap, there is one who has provided himself as a substitution. That's our third gospel word. The only one who can fix this is Jesus Christ. This is God's own son who took on human flesh and lived among us, lived, lived a human life and faced life as we face it with all of the hardships and difficulties, facing temptation as we face temptation, but never having sinned. And he gave his life, the perfect sacrifice on the cross, taking our punishment for sin on himself. He substituted himself for us. And if we would only believe, that's our fourth gospel word, if we would only believe that he did just that, if we would acknowledge our sin, if we would come like the jailer in desperation and throw ourselves before God, exercising simple faith in him, then we'll receive the forgiveness of our sins and we will be saved just as the jailer was saved that night. And because Jesus was raised from the dead on the third day, completing his mission, he then offers you and me life, our fifth gospel word. He offers us life, eternal and abundant here and now to all who will believe. See, that's exactly what he means when he said, when, when Paul and Silas said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. This is exactly what they would have explained to the jailer and to his household when they spoke the word of the Lord to him. And Christian, if your heart, if your heart is for those who do not yet know Jesus, if you genuinely have a heart for that, then you'll, you'll take this and you'll learn it. You'll learn those five gospel words. You think about all the things you could take out of this message and there's a lot that we've already said and there's a little bit more to come. But, but the, the question, like, what am I gonna do with the message this week? How am I gonna apply it this week? You're gonna memorize those five words. You're gonna put them onto your phone. You're gonna provide a, a link, a, a bookmark in your browser. You're gonna have it there so it's ready so that when you're at work and you get into a conversation with someone about the Lord, you're gonna open your f phone up to those five gospel words and you're gonna walk someone through it in the way I just walked you through it. Because you have a heart to see people come to faith in Jesus Christ and you know how to share the gospel with them. And finally, and this, this just flows from everything else we've talked about, when you have Christ at the center and you know the gospel and, and, and you're ready to share it with people, then you're gonna long to see people respond in faith. You want to see what Paul and Silas saw that night. The lack of meism in Paul and Silas is striking. But it's also striking in this newly converted jailer. He's a brand new Christian. And genuine salvation by faith alone always results in tangible expressions of that faith. In other words, we believe and come to faith in Christ. Works has no part of it. But as soon as we believe by faith, works are gonna follow. This is a big debate in, in Christianity about faith and works and how they, how they play together. And William Booth, uh, the founder of the Salvation Army, said this, faith and works should travel side by side, step answering to step, 
like the legs of men walking. First, faith. There's no doubt that has to be first. First, faith, and then works, and then faith again, and then works again, until they can scarcely distinguish which is the one and which is the other. That's what we see from this new convert, this jailer who just became a brand new Christian. He exercises first faith, and then he exercises works. This is what we see come out of him. He's just been saved, but notice verse 33, he took Paul and Silas, and he washed their wounds. He got baptized at once. That's a work, an expression of faith. And all his family, who had also heard the word of God and who had also responded in faith, were baptized. Verse 34, he brought them into his house. He said, he made them a meal and he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. Now please understand, we read that and go, that's a nice thing for him to do, but it was absolutely counter to everything he should have been doing as the jailer. The jailers were hired in Roman culture to be mean, to be cruel, to make incarceration difficult for everybody who was in the prison. They weren't there to provide them comfort. They weren't there to heal their wounds. In fact, the jailers in that culture didn't provide food to any prisoners. If a prisoner didn't have someone on the outside to bring food to them, they died of starvation in prison. The only way any prisoners ever ate was because someone on the outside brought them food to eat. This jailer has done everything that his culture says he should not have been doing. His salvation is so real, his conversion has transformed him so completely that he's risking it all to live out the gospel. And you and I should long to see such conversions. We should long to see people come to faith exactly like this. We should long to see miraculous and evidential conversions where the person becomes a follower of Christ and their life is completely transformed. After all of this, the scene shifts back. This is the next day, verse 35. The magistrates, they sent the police saying, let those men go. And we could ask the question, if you remember back to the other message, they were so mad at Paul and Silas. We could ask the question, why in the world are they now having this change of heart? Just, just let them go. There's a number of reasons why that might have happened. It could be that their intention was always only to throw them in jail overnight, let cooler heads prevail, and everybody would just go on with their life the next day. Could be that it was that. It could also be that these magistrates who were Greeks would have been as given to the ideas that that, that um, the superstitions that they believed and that Poseidon had caused this earthquake, they knew that these were unjust charges. They knew they threw them in jail and beat them um, despite any charges. Maybe they were thinking Poseidon was mad and they didn't want to tick off Poseidon any more than they already had. In any event, verses 36 through 38, we see Paul and Silas invoking their Roman citizenship something they hadn't done the night before. So they have certain rights as Roman citizens, and they demand that their magistrates come themselves and take us out themselves because the arrest, the beating, the imprisonment were all unlawful. And we, and we read in the text, this is in verse 30, 38, they were afraid, the magistrates were terrified when they heard that they were Roman citizens. Verse 39, so they came, and this is crazy. Can you ever imagine your government apologizing to you for anything? It doesn't happen. They came and they apologized to them and they took them out and they asked, they asked them, would, now listen guys, would you just mind leaving, leaving the city? Just be better for everyone? But they had, at this point, they have no leverage. They had un, unlawfully imprisoned them and beaten them. So all, you know, Paul and Silas are holding all the chips. They have all the leverage, they have all the chips. So they've asked them to leave, but, but they're not gonna leave. And we might ask the question like, why in the world at this point 
Paul and Silas are so Christ-centered. It's not about themselves. Why are they making this, these magistrates do this song and dance? Are they trying to get some like little petty revenge on them? And it's not that at all. What Paul and Silas are trying to do is set up this little church that has been established in Philippi. Lydia got saved, others got saved. The word of God was spreading. There's no doubt there's gonna be an impact from what happened in the prison this night. Lydia's got believers gathering at our house. Philippi is going to become a pretty prominent church. Paul loved this church. He wrote a letter to this church. There's several members of the, of the church in Philippi that are mentioned in other places. And Philippi gave offerings to support the mission. So all of this, Paul is doing this so that that church would be able to function and live with some safety and security. The magistrates certainly wouldn't be inclined to cause them any grief after this. So the magistrates asked them, would you mind leaving town? So verse 40, so they went out of the prison and visited Lydia. They didn't leave town. They went to her house. They went back to the church. We don't know exactly how long they stayed, but it could have been for a little while when they had seen the brothers, they encouraged them, and then eventually they departed. Paul and Silas longed to see people come to faith in Christ and they were leaving Philippi knowing that many had come to faith in Christ and a church had been established at Lydia's house. And I guess I just want to ask the question, do you long for that? Do you have a comfortable Christianity that's really just about you and, and, and your personal worship and living your Christian life or do you really truly desire that the people that you have in your life that do not yet know Jesus, do you really have a desire for them to come to Christ? And are you willing to do whatever it takes to see them do that? It's gonna take putting Christ at the center. It's gonna take knowing the gospel in order to explain it. It's gonna take having a longing for them to come to Christ. See, I've gone about this asking the question, what must I do to see others saved? And I've spoken really to Christians during this entire message. This room is filled mostly with Christians. Those online are likely mostly Christians watching uh, this service right now and hearing this message. And that's been the challenge for us. But, but if you're in the room and you've not yet come to faith in Jesus Christ, if you're watching and you've not yet become a believer, that you've heard the gospel, you've heard the five gospel words, you've heard our heart for you to come to faith in Christ, you've seen the conversion of the jailer, and my appeal to you would be, go back to those words, consider those five gospel words, and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. You can read those gospel words on our website. You can come after the service and there's gonna be leaders up here at the front who would love to talk to you about this. If you're new to Harvest and you're gonna make your way to Guest Central, uh, because this is your first time, you could talk to the leaders that are gonna be there. You could go to Connections. You could stop one of our pastors, one of our elders, and you could talk about these things and say, I wanna to come to faith in Jesus. I wanna believe. And we'd be happy to do that with you. Amen? Let me pray for us. Father, uh, obviously a great challenge in today's uh, message for those of us who are uh, believers. Father, I pray that you would be stirring up a, an incredible, unexplainable passion in each one of us to see neighbors, friends, coworkers, family, even strangers come to faith in Jesus Christ, to believe as the jailer believed. And Father, I pray for those who are watching, those who are in the room right now, who have not yet made that commitment, not yet believed. And I pray, God, that they would reach out in faith, that your Holy Spirit would convince them of the truths that they've heard here today, to believe these five gospel words, and to turn in faith to Jesus Christ. Father, this is a work, again, that only you can do. We're privileged, Father to be able to work alongside you and alongside your spirit to see many come to faith in Christ. And God, we pray this in our Savior's strong name.